one. to yet another installment of the Alpha Quadrant. I am Garrett Wong, your host, my co-host, Aaron Eisenberg, AKA Nog from Deep Space Nine. And AKA. Our, AKA, our producer, of course, Evil Dick, uh, season eight winner of Big Brother, <laughs> and our most esteemed special guest this week. We're so happy to have him. He's here. Everyone's been waiting for him. Uh, none other than Quark, AKA Armin <laughs> Shiverman from Deep Space Nine. Oh my God, is that a Quark? Uh, bobble doll, bobble head? What no, it, it, the, the head doesn't move. But okay. isn't it weird how similar this actually looks to you, Armin, as Quark? It, it does, especially the eyes. It does, yeah, the eyes are... When, I'm, eyes when are. I'm missing you, I, 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 I keep this nearby, just so you know. But that's, you know that's disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Armin, I think they need uh, Quark... Pez dispensers. I think that uh, would. Yeah. Uh, anything could come out of my mouth at any time. Yes, a Pez dispenser would be a good idea. That's what it was like on the show. Welcome. I, well, I, I'm so excited to have you here, Armin. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be with you guys. Oh, everybody online was really excited, too. It was a, the, everybody was very excited when they heard that you were going to be on. So and it's nice meeting you. Thank you, thank you. Been a fan of your work for a long time. I've only been a fan for a few years. <laughs> it was after the show, but um, but yeah, uh, since then your work has really, it's really really grown. Being sarcastic, I just kidding. <laughs> They're so serious right now. We're all so serious. <laughs> so Armin, um, <clears throat> I don't know if people know this, but uh, Armin was actually the very first Star Trek actor that I met. Um, I had been cast as Ensign Kim. I, I was ordered to run down to wardrobe and have a fitting. And after the fitting, they said, we're going to take you on the Deep Space Nine set and introduce you to some, some people down there. And, I wasn't uh, there that day, apparently. Uh, you were not there, but Armin was there. And I remember, yeah. uh, I remember being tapped on the shoulder and I turned around and I see Armin in his full cork makeup. And his teeth it literally scared the bejesus out of me when i when i saw you for the first time because i i feel that with all star trek there's they put this filter on all the lens on, on all the cameras which really kind of softens everything but when you see ferengi teeth and an alien makeup up close without any type of softening filter it's jarring to, to say the least and i just remember like <gasps> just seeing you um and it's it did scare me I remember that day vividly, Garrett, but I wasn't in makeup that day. <laughs> Zing! Yeah, wow. But, so, wow. Yeah, I, I remember uh, it, it, was, uh, it was you and Robbie, I think, came down at the same time. Uh, really? I think so. I remember Robbie was there as well. And, uh, and you guys were so scared. <laughs> you were so scared. You didn't know what you were getting into. Not so much that the makeup upset you, but that you were about to start this uh, voyage. Yes. And, and, and you thought, uh, I don't know what you thought, but it was, you could see the fear in your eyes. And it made me smile because I remember that same look in my own face about uh, two years before. So, Gotcha. You know, uh, you know, it's funny that you say that, Gary, because that's exactly how I felt when I met you for the first time when I um, ventured over to Voyager. <laughs> Yeah. On initiations. <laughs> you felt the same way? No, not since then. It's, it's, and my okay. eyes have gotten 
softer. So it's, I, I, it I makes life you. easier. I got you. I, I will say this though, uh, Armin, I have to thank you because you actually took me aside and kind of gave me the, uh, the speech. You know, you kind of told me about the ropes of how to deal with different things and what a forced call was and check your paychecks. And I mean, you were really just uh, very generous and very <laughs> uh, forthcoming about all the things I needed to know as a new actor on a Star Trek show. And I did not expect that to come from you. So thank you for well, that. Uh, you, you, when you, when we were working together, I was a, a board director on the Screen Actors Guild in the union, and uh, these were some of the things that, as a union rep, so it was, I was sort of passing on to you, uh, so that you would understand that uh, Paramount uh, were the, indeed the true Ferengi. Yes. <laughs> Very well said. Very well said. <laughs> well, with uh, all due respect, Armin, I think I think you know through the seven years of the show. You know, out of all of the, the people on our show, you, you, you were most definitely always the ambassador on our show. You made everybody feel, you know, comfortable that they knew, you know, where the craft service table was, that you knew who the, you know, the first AD and the second AD were. And, and you know, you made every guest star feel welcome. And um, I never, ever forgot that, uh, to be honest. And if I ever work again, I hope to, you know, be the same kind of actor that I felt you were not only to me, but to everybody else. Well, thank you. I, I learned that at the feet of Ron Perlman. Uh, when I was a recurring character on Beauty and the Beast, and it was my first venture as a recurring character on TV, um, I watched Ron Perlman, who was encased in three hours of makeup, if not more. And uh, he was always very gracious. And I asked him once, why he was that way and he said because a TV show I'm number one on the call sheet I am the host of this party and I have to make sure all my guests uh, feel comfortable and um, and I said exactly what you just said almost verbatim I said if I ever get in that situation I'll remember that and try to emulate what Perlman gave me and though I wasn't number one on the call sheet far from it um, <laughs> uh, I was still in the Ferengi episodes, I was the host of the parties. Always. And you know what was awesome about our show, looking back and, and thinking about it? And, and I think it helped the chemistry between you, myself, Max, Jeff, um, anybody else that we had had the opportunity to work with together, Little Green Men, anytime we were all together, you would always open up your home and get everybody together to rehearse. And the only other person that did that with me was James Darren Jimmy when I had um, uh, it's it's only a paper moon he called he told Ron Surma you know hey would Aaron be interested in rehearsing and because for all those years we were doing it and I saw the benefit of being able to do that um, and and how it helped our performances as well as the our chemistry together I was like of course you know and and it's it, it it's too bad we don't all get the opportunity, I think, with all the actors who do that, because it is a tough thing to do. It's based on people's schedules and time, but I think it really benefited, especially the three of us. And um, it's just, it was just, you know, it was just wonderful. It was, it was just such a great experience. I wish Max could be here with us too right now. I think that would be fantastic. But well, I, I never heard of anyone besides us doing that, so I'm really happy to hear that Jimmy did it as well with you. But as you know, Garrett doesn't know, but as you know. Being in that head, and, and, and after about 10 hours, it would get to feel like a bad head cold. Um, and, and in order for us to complete our anywhere from 12 to 16 hour days, in order to stay ahead of the, of the curve, in order to fulfill our obligations as an actor, especially in the latter part of the day, we had to be more prepared than the others because the, makeups, the makeup just made us feel ill, not ill, but as I said, like a head cold, the yeah. stuffed up and, and our energy was gone. And, and we had to just uh, keep slugging along uh, in, that, in that head and those costumes uh, in the latter part of the day. And, and I just thought that the rehearsal that we did on the weekends was a way of staying ahead of the curve. And you guys Absolutely. were incredibly gracious. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. That's amazing because I, I never knew that you guys did that. We just we definitely did not have the luxury of doing anything like that on Voyager. I oh, wish we could have had professionals, Garrett, on our show. <laughs> we went that but, extra mile for our show. But going back to what <laughs> what you said, Armin, earlier about you know how uh, Ron Perlman was the one that sort of invited, uh, welcomed you, and then you welcomed me. You were the first person I met in the Star Trek world, um, and now that I think of it, I really took your example and I ran with it because every guest star we had, I was that person who would lay out, I'd roll out that carpet for them. And to, the, to this day, there are guest stars. Who say, Aaron's face, oh, he's having a heart attack down there. Garrett, Garrett <laughs> is actually, you know, he, he really was so welcoming and he was, you know, he, he told me this and that, helped me out with all the things I needed to know. So I really, I, I have to thank you yet again for really giving me the, um, I guess the right uh, uh, blueprint <laughs> knowing how to treat uh, other guest actors that came on. Well, thank you, Garrett. Uh, you know, one good deed can just uh, exponentially turn into lots of good deeds. So we have to thank Ron who did it for me. Maybe someone did it for Ron. Yes. Uh, and you've done it for other people. Those people that you interacted with, they've gone on to do the same thing, hopefully. You know, just make our business and our situation um, a little bit kinder to other people, especially in the franchise, in the Star Trek franchise. Just what you were talking about earlier, um, you walk onto a set and, and everybody looks alien. Everybody uh, has sharp teeth. Everybody looks different than you've ever seen anyone look before. And, and that's got to be off-putting when you're, it's your first day. So in order to make that first day comfortable so that they can do their best work and then you react off of their best work and you try to do your best work, it, it's just a way of making the workplace that much better. Yeah. That's true. Aaron, were you about to say some smart ass comments? No, 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 no. He was, he was I have nothing, nothing to say. Dying, uh. Nothing to say. I did do an episode of Voyager, but you know, I don't, my memory's a little foggy. I get a little. I don't remember any book. I wasn't there that day, Aaron. If you, you were know, there, I, I, I worked was, the whole week, but that's I, just beside the point. You I, worked with Robert I Belfer. did meet you. I did meet you on the seventh year of our show. I did meet you then. You, you and did. it was a wonderful experience. Yeah. <laughs> You're not gonna let me live that down. Um, so not we only have to save that story, Armin, for when Nikki's on the show because it involves Nikki. <laughs> That's when I actually met Garrett in season seven, and there's a whole running joke between Garrett and I. But we're holding that story for when <laughs> Nikki DeBoer joins the show because she was instrumental in Garrett and I really bonding <laughs> and becoming friends. <laughs> okay, I, I'm looking forward to hearing that story. <laughs> we'll share that with you at some point. We'll share that with you. So, uh, oh, go ahead, Garrett. Go I, ahead. I was just going to say that not only did I, when I came down for that wardrobe fitting and I, and I was not working, but my actual first day of work was with Armin in Cork. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's where Voyager, you know, starts off at Deep Space Nine before they take off. Did he remember his lines? I, I, they were very prepared. They were very, <laughs> they were very scared. They I was scared. I was scared. Very, very scared. I was, oh my God. I was so scared. That it would have to be intimidating. It was I mean, so it, it would. I mean, you're coming you got, in a franchise like that. I, you guys have to understand. I had gone from literally, I, I did a, um, I, I was guest starring on, on All-American Girl, Margaret Cho's sitcom. I went from that to series regular on Voyager. That was my next speaking role. So I come on the set and, and Armin, thank God Armin was there. It just, it just, I was so damn nervous, but it, it was just, um, it was like a calming blanket to have Armin there. Without him there, I think I probably would have just shriveled up into a pool of nothingness. <laughs> so yes, thank God. You're lucky, you're lucky you had me and not Avery. Yeah. I <laughs> <laughs> I do concur with that. <laughs> that would have been you know, that would have been something else. Well, I had great experiences with Avery. I have to say, well, I, I really enjoyed working with Avery. But um, you know, I, I want to ask you. Well, I don't know if you have questions, Garrett, but I wanted to ask Armin. You know, I know that I know there was a, a a big evolution of the Ferengi from the Last Outpost through Deep Space Nine. When you began the show, and and one of the great stories that I always love is when you auditioned. Uh, for Quark, it was you and Max auditioning at this for the same character, um, and then Max ended up getting there was a role in the script in the pilot that said the pit boss, and 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 Max ended up getting the pit boss, which then became Rom, and then we were all three a family. 
Um, right. and, and you have a wonderful story that I, I, I like, I don't know if everybody's heard, I don't know if Garrett's heard it, of that, I don't know if it was your final callback between you and Max, and Max was sitting out on the steps. Um, I don't know if you remember that story. I um, certainly do, yeah. I mean, uh, it, yes, I do remember. It was and, the, it was the final you, callback for Max and I. It was Max's final callback, not my final callback. But it was oh. Max's final callback. I, um, I had already gone in once and auditioned, uh, not that day, but a couple, actually months, months before. That's another story altogether. Months? Months. Months, months before months, months, auditioning months. and even getting the role. Yeah, two months before I met Max, I had auditioned. Wow. And, and I thought for, for the two months, I thought I didn't get it. I thought uh, it had passed me by. I mean, we all know that if we don't get a, a phone call from the agent within a week or so at the most, that uh, it, it's, it's finished. So I kept trying to get feedback, and uh, the agent couldn't get any feedback from Junior Lowry's office. They just uh, didn't say anything. And... So I, I just gave it up, thought, okay, well, they went a different way. Wow, I didn't know that. And then, uh, that, lo and behold, they said, yes, you have an audition at Paramount. And I went in and did my audition. I did every, every line that Quark had in the, in the first episode. And as I, before I went in, I, I saw Max sitting out there. I never met Max before. And I, but I recognized him from the next generation. And, and I... So I, I thought I'd, I'd like to talk to him. So I did my audition. I knew he had to come out uh, th those steps, uh, you know, what is it, on the, uh, on the Gower side of, the, of Paramount. Mm -hmm. And um, I waited for him to come out the doors, and he came out, and I said, hi, I'm, I'm Armin Schimmerman. Did you put him in the corner? Like, did you put him up against the wall? No, sir. We were, oh, sitting, okay. on, we were sitting on those, what is it, three or four, three or four steps outside of the entrance to the Gower entrance to Paramount, you know, on the way to the parking lot, yeah. parking structure. And, uh, and I asked him, I introduced myself and I asked him, you know, how his audition had gone and was very friendly. And we started to talk. We, we sat there for, I think about an hour, maybe an hour, 15 minutes, just discussing how we had approached the character. And that's the beginning of a very long and dear friendship with Max Prudential. And indeed, in that first episode, there was no mention of the character's name. As you said, right. it was just a pit boss. But he did have a line. And this is some, one of the things we discussed in that hour and 15 minutes. Um, we both said, well, this character that's the pit boss, he seems to be Quark's brother. So mm -hmm. that must be a meaningful role, um, although the character doesn't have a name. So we sat there and discussed that. And... Um, and we were sort of saying, well, if I don't get this one part, maybe I can get the other part. And luck would have it, I, I won the, the coin toss. But, um, uh, but that's the beginning of where Max and I uh, formed our incredible relationship. And, and to, to finish the, the question I had, in the evolution of the Ferengi from, I, I believe, from The Last Outpost um, to our show, when you auditioned, um, did you, did you change what you had done before? Oh my did you God. Kind of, yes. and, I and, hate what I did on the last outpost. Why? 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 Because it was horrible. It was awful. <laughs> it it was, was, the, specifically. The, well, the, the reason I asked that. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. There's a, a, a delay. I'm sorry. Yeah. The Frankie were never meant to be comic originally. They were never meant to be. They were never meant to be comic. They were meant to be the new Klingons. They were meant to be ferocious, ugly, uh, 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 intimidating characters. Well, it sounds like me, but... Um, uh. <laughs> That's why they hired me. Uh, uh, and, and I failed miserably, as, uh, as Zach would say. Um, and uh, and I, my whole intention, as I sat there talking to Max, as I had auditioned, my whole intention was to play it as radically opposite as I could to that, to that last outpost. Interesting. See, I didn't know that. I never knew that. And then, and then the, from there on, you get the role. And what did you expect or what did you see, foresee at that time as the evolution of the Ferengi possibly going based on your character, mine, 
And of course, we didn't know that mine would end up in Starfleet. But um, and 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 Max's character Rom, did you have an idea of of where they might be going? And and do you think it was achieved for the better, for worse, or somewhere in between? And one of the things that I loved, I loved your speech to Cisco, and I can't exactly remember the episode. Computer, the episode when. It's Siege, Chef, seven, five, seven, seven something. It, oh, sorry. so it was the Siege when I lose my leg. And, and, and it was, and the dynamic with our family and how you protected me in that, even though, you know, we had our conflicts. It was just, I feel like that evolution was pretty awesome. In, in, but I also know that there were things that I think, or maybe I don't know it, but would be interested in, did you feel we should have, as Ferengi, gone in more, certain directions that we didn't and went in some that we shouldn't have too much. Maybe well, to, answer, to answer your question, Karen, um, of course I did not know w w what direction we were going and when we started. Um, I only knew, actually when we started in the first six months of the show, I was really only concerned about Armin and not about Aaron or Max. I was only concerned. Well, you were very kind to me when we had a makeup test and we both sat in that golf cart and I knew right away you were a good man. You were very uh, supportive, and you said this is where it begins. And I felt like we were. It was a whole new, a whole new direction my life was taking, and I I, I felt like part of a team right away. So, Thank but you. I, I, I let, let me answer your question if you if you right. right. <laughs> hey, stopping you. <laughs> yeah, he talks a lot. If you don't know that. He worked with me for seven years. He knows me. Um, so I, the, first, the first six months, no, I was more selfish than that. Uh, but, uh, and I certainly did not know in what direction the, uh, the storylines for, for myself and, and the other Ferengi were going to go. Uh, I am delighted to keep answering your question. With the way it went, I wouldn't change a thing. I, oh. I, think, Ira, I think Ira and company, and it was Ira primarily who was writing the Ferengi episodes, um, I think Ira and company uh, did an incredible job. I, I wouldn't change anything. My, my hope at the beginning of the show I, uh, was instilled in me when I did Last Outpost. I was working with uh, Brent Spiner, who was an old friend of mine. And I asked him sort of the same question. I said, well, what do you want to do with this computer, this an Android character? And his quote, which I've never forgotten, he said, I want to take the character with the least amount of potential and make him the character with the most amount of potential. And I think all of us want to do that. Garrett, you want to do that. Aaron wants to do that. Everybody wants well, to do that. Garrett didn't get promoted, but I most certainly did. So. <laughs> and, uh, and so that was my, that was my anticipation, was to, to fulfill the potential of the character. And I certainly, as I said to you before, wanted to get beyond very quickly those limited um, parameters that I had set, and it's my fault, that I had set in the last outpost. Um, would I change anything? N n yes, there's a, there are a couple of episodes that I wasn't particularly fond of. Uh, I, sometimes when we got too silly, I was not particularly happy. Um, when, we, when we did things that were um, with had twinges or tinges of drama to it as opposed to, to uh, farce. Um, I preferred those. I was never happy with the outrageous sort of things that they sometimes had us do. Um, and I am, and not because you're sitting here, but I am beyond delighted of what they did with Nog. Uh, the, what they did with you to, to, to give you such gravitas, and to give you such a such a arc to make you from this young kid who was just scampering around the promenade to a respected leader, um, uh, I'm very happy I did that, and, and you did a phenomenal job completing it. Thank you. Well, thank you, thank you, Dick. Thank you. You can clap. To thank you, Garrett. Thank you very much. Thanks, Garrett. Um, well, I'll be honest. You know, as I've said before. 
you were always right there helping me along the way for seven years. And, and you were, you, I got to you, you. Before you go a little further, let me answer that too. <laughs> <laughs> um, as you know, Aaron, um, as you know, um, the actors on our show were very nice to each other. We were all one big family. But in a family, some people get treated better than others. And it was always my perception that uh, some of the people on the set, some of the actors, uh, sort of thought of us as a little bit less equal than others. The Ferengi were less equal. Maybe really? because of the makeup, maybe because we were silly sometimes, maybe because we were short, don't know. Right. And at least that was my perception. Aaron. And as, as number seven on the call sheet, I felt enormously responsible to make sure that, that you, Max, Jeff, uh, Cecily, uh, Wally, not so much Wally because he could take care of himself, but um, everybody was treated with the same respect that they treated Avery or Nana or Renee. And I, whenever I felt that there was some lack of respect for us, uh, it was incumbent upon me to stand up because that was my power. I could stand up and say, don't do that. Mm. We, are, we are performing these characters to the best of our ability. And if, if we're sometimes silly, those are the characters that are silly, not the actors performing. Very well sure. said. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> I've kind of monopolized that questioning, so I should... Let can I can I go, can I go now? Yeah. Of course. Of course. <laughs> That's uh, where I was going. You don't have to be a smart ass about it. I wasn't it. being smart ass. So <laughs> so Armin, you mentioned earlier that I was lucky that I got you in my first scene instead of Avery. Um I don't I don't know if you guys even know my Avery story at all. Uh, no, I don't know it at all, Garrett. Holy moly. So uh when they we had a premiere of Voyager at the Paramount Theater. Did you go to I that? Was there. I was there. I was there. Avery was there also. I wasn't also. invited. Just, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Avery was there also. And I remember looking back at him and just to gauge his reaction while he was watching our pilot. And I will have to say that I think Voyager's pilot is a pretty darn good one. I think it's, I think it's stronger than, than TNG's and, and pardon me, but also DS9's first episode. I thought Voyager's pilot episode was fantastic. Um, Enterprise is, a, is also a very good one. But I remember looking back at Avery and he just kind of was just, he had this look like he wasn't happy that he was there or he didn't enjoy something. I don't know. But the funny thing was, is not long before, not, well, you know, the LA riots had pretty much happened in, was it 93? Right before the start of Voyager, really, 93 or 94. And you have those images of Korean shop owners, you know, battling in South Central against the hoodlums. Dude, it was the wild and west. So it was, it was really blacks Asians. against Asians kind of a thing, right? So um, every time that I got off of, I walked out of stage eight and I looked across at your, the Deep Space Nine stage, um, every now and then I would see Avery Brooks come out or we'd walk past each other in, in, the, in the corridor between, between the sound stages. And he would, I would make eye contact with him and I would always go to, I would begin to say something, but he'd look away. Like I wasn't even a human being. He would just look away. He didn't even care to talk to me. And it, it hurt my feelings. And this happened time and time and time again. Um, but the day that it changed was probably a, a good two years, at season two of Voyager. I was doing a convention in San Francisco, California, and a Star Trek convention. And I was sitting in the green room with my parents. And we're waiting, you know, and then, Avery walks in through the door. And I remember he was wearing this, this linen suit, you know, and he had the sunglasses on. And he walks in and the sunlight was filtered. It, it looked like a John Woo movie where the doves were going to fly through, you know. And he walks in. Everything was slow-mo to me. And I remember looking up and going, oh, thinking it's him, the, the actor who doesn't acknowledge me. Um, at that point, my parents both jump up and run to him. I mean, they run up to him and they're like, oh my God, it's you, you know, Commander Cisco. can we take a photo with you? And it, he's just, he's completely taken off guard. And he looks, he goes, oh, uh, oh, you're Garrett's parents? Oh yeah, yes, uh, of course, I'll take a photo. So he takes the photo with them. 
And the minute my parents basically kowtow to Avery Brooks was the turning point. He then acknowledged me. Like every time I saw him in the, in the, in the, in the you know, corridors between our sound stages, he would say, uh, good day to you, young man. How you doing today? Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. Good to talk to you. And then he'd walk on, you know. So it took that act of, I don't, I don't know, just adulation from my parents to actually have him acknowledge me. But until then, it was really, it was a sad day. I, I just couldn't get his attention to save my life. He wasn't easy to talk to. Mm. Uh, he, when he talked to you and meant to talk, when he was directing us, for instance, he, he was enormously friendly, but he, he was very private and yes. it was very difficult to start a conversation with him. Um, I imagine that because your parents were there mm. and he has great respect for seniority mm -hmm. uh, as well as for youth, uh, much younger than, than you were, uh, mm. I mean, for kids and stuff like that, Right. Um, that uh, he could open up to that. But I, I, he was always a very, very private person. Yeah. And I must say that in my seven years of working with him, um, I didn't get much further than what you just talked about. Mm. Wow. Okay. Well, yeah. Avery and I once went to Magic Mountain together. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we rode on the log ride together, and he sat in the back, and I sat in the front. And Did you guys both go, Woo! <laughs> They got one of the pictures. They got the picture. But he doesn't like roller coasters. You know, I couldn't get him on Colossus, so... You know, but he loves the bumper cars. He gets a little aggro, but he loves the bumper cars. <laughs> See, uh, okay. that should be a convention. Come with Avery Brooks to Magic Mountain. There you and go. Ride. And okay. ride the log ride. <laughs> Who would come up with this random stuff, man? You know, I, the one thing I wanted to say, though, Arvin, the funny thing is, in order for me to understand how to play a Ferengi, I had to watch The Last Outpost. So I'm that... So sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, but that's what's kind of ironic. It, Hearing what you said, which I've never heard before, in the fact that you want to do everything so opposite of that, so you bring that to your audition as Quark, I watch that and go, oh, that's what a Ferengi is. So I bring that to my audition for Nog. Now you see why I was nice to you, Aaron. I had screwed <laughs> you up originally, and I, and I probably felt really guilty. Well, what I realize now is basically you were playing juvenile Ferengi, where on Deep Space Nine, you actually played an adult. So I was, you know, emulating the juvenile Ferengi. I still want a whip, though. I'm very upset I don't have a whip. <laughs> Those whips, were, weren't they only in that one particular yeah, episode? Yeah, they, they were ridiculous. They gave me this piece of plastic <laughs> rubber, and they said, make it look lethal. And I said, you're kidding me. And uh, uh, so, yeah, the whips, uh, I think that a number of things were done at the last moment on that episode. My makeup, for instance, the whips, um, the costumes were all wrong. Uh, they should never have cast me. Um, it, it, it oh, was, come on. No, 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 no. I take full responsibility for that fiasco. I'm very happy that that fiasco led to us sitting here today. But uh, Yes, it but did. I, it did. But it was... I will, I can never live that down. It, it was, it, you know, the terrible thing about, about being on film is it never disappears. It's always there. Yeah, it, it, it just lives on and on and on. You can never well, erase it. Well, it's great that I have a clip here that I can play. No, I don't, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, and, and I heard from Max too, Aaron, that when, when they got cast as Ferengi, um, they were sent to Last Outpost to emulate. And so what happened was that bad behavior just got continued and continued and continued. And uh, and really, when Max went to audition for Quark and in that hour and 15 minute chat we had, he told me that's the way he auditioned that way. Wow. And, and I said, no, I, I can't do that. I just, I don't, want to, I don't want to do it that way. I want to do but it. But I think that's what was so great, you know? And then you made Quark you and, and then Nog grew and, and, and Max developed Rom and we all became Ferengi, yet we became ourselves, not us here, but the characters that we built. That's the writers, yeah. Aaron. That's the writers. Uh, the, the writers watch us in dailies. Garrett knows this. The, uh, they watch us in dailies. They see us on the set. 
they, they, they get, begin to know who we are. They have, they have only characters in their head when they start the scripts. Then as we flesh out those characters and they see our uh, eccentricities, our idiosyncrasies, uh, they begin to incorporate those into, into the character. Um, so there were writers? There were writers, yeah, yeah. There were writers? I thought it was just all You thought you made up all those words by yourself. <laughs> I thought I did it all! <laughs> you I thought it was Deep Space Nog, for God's sakes. You would have put Cosmo and Judy Brown out of business. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Judy Brown. All right, all right. Uh, Armin, Armin, um, your favorite episode of Deep Space Nine to film and why, and your least favorite episode to film and why? Well, it's easy. That, those are easy questions. I've been asked enough times, Gary, so <clears throat> I can do oh. that. Um, my favorite is uh, Far Beyond the Stars, which is, in my opinion, the best Star Trek episode ever made. Uh, it is incredible. It is the best of science fiction. It is a phenomenal episode where we push the envelope to the umpteenth degree. I'm not sure if you're aware of it, and for those who aren't, it's an episode where we only spend about five minutes on the station and the rest of the episode is where we are humans uh, in the 1950s and we are writers. And, and in fact, from, from what we were just talking about. Oh, I remember about, that episode. That was yeah. I was a newspaper boy. It's where the writers of, of our show pulled back the curtain and said, pay no attention to the actors who are playing these parts. Look at the writers. It's the writers who are doing all this. And um, it is a phenomenal piece of writing, of directing by Avery Books, of acting by all, not only the series regulars, but the, but the recurring characters as well, who did a phenomenal job. It, it is brilliant, brilliant TV, um, shattering the fourth wall. Uh, great, so that's my favorite. And it was, I think that was in our sixth season. And I think also in the sixth season, was a show called uh, Profit and, and uh, Lace, where I'm sure the writers decided it would be great fun to have Quark become a woman and, uh, and, and dress him up uh, with the biggest boobs you've ever seen. Um, and that was my least favorite, not because I got to play a woman. I've done that in the theater several times. Um, but the fact that my character went through an entire episode of seeing, of seeing what it is to be harassed to be uh, um, uh, just eye candy. <laughs> um, objectified. <laughs> yeah, objectified. And, and then from my character, Quark, never to learn from that experience. Mm. That was why it's my least favorite, is to have gone through that entire arc of that episode and then come out the other side unchanged, un, uneducated by what he had just gone through. So those are the yin and the yang in my experience. Did they, did you ever, I'm assuming you articulated that, and I'm curious as to why they didn't give you that growth. Do you know why? Ira, did Ira ever say, well, I don't feel that, you know, what, why weren't you given that experience to learn from it and, and, and grow from it? Do you know? I don't know. And, and as you probably know, I don't know what it was like on Voyager. I do know what it was like on Next Generation, but it was, uh, Rick Berman's uh, number one goal, the prime directive, to keep the actors and the writers as far apart as possible. Um, there's, a, there's a lovely incident that happened, I believe it was in our third year. Um, we were having a Christmas party in Quark's bar and Ira Bear stepped up onto the little platform that was in Quark's. And he said, I wanna play a little game. I wanna play a little game. And we didn't know who this guy was. Who was he the next? <laughs> uh, um, and he, he, he brought five guys up onto the stage with him. And he picked out Leslie Moonves, he pick, picked out Nana, he picked out a couple others. Luckily, I wasn't picked out. And he turned to these four people that he picked out in the, in the audience to, and said, uh, who are these five guys? And Leslie Moonves couldn't answer, Nana couldn't answer, none of the people that were who were asked could answer who these guys were and he said to us these are your writers these are the guys that write that write your characters you should know who they are mm. so, but 
So That's we got a, to, we got to know the writers a little better after that because Ira was insistent that we know more about the writers. But as we all know, the writers' building and where we shot the shows were miles apart. And so uh, well, I didn't I didn't have many conversations with the writers about what they had to do with Clark. I would sometimes take them to lunch and, and just ask them the same question over and over. Was if you can just tell me what my IQ is, that's all I want to know. What's Quark's <laughs> IQ? That's all. I well, I, I actually think we benefited a lot from the fact that they were so close. You say miles apart, but I think you know, in a, a lot of productions, you know, they're shooting in Vancouver and the writers are in LA, and they don't yeah. have the opportunities to get so you're a, a little. Young, you're a young man. You're a young man, Aaron. And, and so you're used to shows being shot in Vancouver. When I started no, out- I'm not, I'm not when actually. When I started out, uh, Beauty and the Beast, uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, uh, lots of the shows that I did, uh, the writers were constantly on this, every day, every right. day. And, and I think that's a wonderful thing because I think it gives the opportunity for the writers to, to do exactly what you said earlier, which is to get to know the actors, their idiosyncratic behaviors, their nuances, you know, what their personality is like. Are they outgoing? Are they a little introverted? I, I totally and, agree with you, Eric, but that didn't happen on Deep Space Nine. The oh, writers, I disagree with you. I think it did. I, I specifically oh, hey, remember. Eric, 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 listen to me. Hold on. Let me ask you a question. Were the writers there every day? Well, I wasn't there every day. <laughs> so. I, I wasn't there every day either. But on, on most of the days that I shot for seven years, they were not there. Occasionally they would come, yes. Uh, but I would say they would, I would see them maybe once every two months. Well, I, Sarah, it, what's your I have, oh, you want to know? Yeah, I, I, yeah. I'll tell you what. I, in seven years, I saw Berman on the set twice. Two times in seven years. Well, and Berman wasn't mandate, one of the writers, though. His was... mandate about separating, um, it's all about power, okay? It's all about maintaining this, this you know, uh, we're the all-powerful writers. And I totally disagree with it. I think there should have been a much more collaborative approach where the writers should have been down there every day. And they I, definitely I agree, not. I agree with you, Garrett. You're absolutely right, except for the reason. I totally agree that they should have been there more often. I, I will tell you, perhaps you don't know this, but I will tell you why Rick wanted that separation. Okay. And it, and it comes from TNG. It comes from Next Generation. There was more integration between the writers and the actors in the first couple of years of TNG. Mm. And what happened was they, they would actually have script readings once a week in, in the beginning of their show. Wow, okay. And they would do a script reading. And then the next, when the reading was over, some of the actors would go over to the writers and say, I want that line. Why have you given that to the guest star? Why have you given that to the forge? Why have you given that? I want that line. And, and Berman saw that, saw that the actors were, were causing headaches for the writers and, 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 letting their egos run rampant. And I love all the people on TNG. They're very close friends of mine. But, but Berman did not want that to happen in his second child. And so I think he separated, not for power, but rather to stop that, that misuse of the writer's time and contributions. Okay. Well, that well, makes perfect sense. I, I stand corrected. And honestly, um, that's, that's, that's a bummer that that TNG ruined it for everyone else. <laughs> ah! uh, as, as we know, TNG did indeed ruin it for the rest of us. <laughs> oh, uh, that be our tagline. Well, I specifically remember <laughs> being at the craft service table. Uh, as you let, know, let me tell you one other question. Table. I'm going to get shot. Oh, this. This. Oh. No, this, this is whatever you have to say, I think will take seconds <laughs> what I'm about to say. We all know, all of us sitting here, we all know that the salaries we got on our show was not commensurate with what other TV show actors were being paid. We knew that, we know that. Certainly not in the beginning, maybe as the years went by, we got more. But, but, but in the beginning, we were miserably paid. Mm -hmm. And that's TNG's fault. 
Mm. The problem is, I've never really told this story, so this is sort of a first. When Patrick was hired, he had an English agent. The agent in England was not sufficiently educated in what actors on American TV got. And so when they negotiated a salary, his agent asked for much less. This is in the first year, of course. Um, his asked for much less than they were willing to give. That they, they were probably willing to give more. But that's all the agent wanted? Fine. That's what we're going to give Patrick Stewart. And then they talked to all the other actors, perhaps not LeVar, who had cachet at that time. But they said, we can't give the other actors more than we give the captain. He's number one on the call sheet. And so, um, so those salaries were kept lower because of Patrick's agent. And then when our show came on, they said, well, it's got to be in the same ballpark as what we gave TNG. And I, I don't know about Voyager because you guys were a network show. I don't, I don't know if that changed. Uh, but, it, it really didn't. <laughs> so, so, so as I said, it's TNG. And they went on to do movies and made lots and lots of money after that. You know, God bless them. They, they made up for those years where they weren't being paid. However, the rest of us it, uh, didn't have those opportunities. No, Shoot, I there's, no that guy. there's no Deep Space Nine movie. movie. No Voyager movie. Nothing to make up for the low pay that, that we got while we were on the show. But back to what you said about them, about the TNG actors after their table read, you know, trying to jockey uh, into position to get more lines. So now the acronym Star Trek TNG can stand for the narcissistic generation. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> now, Eric, what were you going to say that I interrupted? Yeah. So... I remember, here's a story I have. I was at the craft service table and Ira came up and I remember on the script, I couldn't, I'm like, oh, that's one of the writers. And I was trying to remember his name. And I remember the script said Ira Steven Bear at the time. And I went, Steven. And I go, hey, what's up, Steven? And he goes, my name's not Steven, it's Ira. I go, oh my God, I'm so sorry. I thought I was gonna get fired after that. I thought that was my last day. I grabbed a donut and ran, but, um, <laughs> But I remember him being there. And then I remember seeing Ron Moore coming down. I remember on the times that I worked, seeing them. And maybe, maybe you know, they just were thought, you know, this is Deep Space Nog. So whenever I show up, they came down and watched my performance. You know, I don't know. Okay. Maybe they, all, all I can so say is I was, with more, I was there more than you, and I rarely saw them. And, I, and Garrett, yes, uh, Berman would come down about twice a year. He usually grabbed me by the shoulder and uh, asked me to tell him who all the crew people's names were. And I said, <laughs> I remember a number of people, he would say, who's that? And I would say, oh, that's so-and-so. They've won four or five Emmys for you, by the way. <laughs> oh, right. Did, did right. you know, uh, Armin, you, Marvin Rush was your DP season one. Is that right? Oh, yeah. Season one yeah. and two. So Marvin, right. So Marvin and his crew got hand, you know, uh, they got passed off to the Voyager uh, show. And, um, one Christmas, he made up all these these sweatshirts with per, little, little Voyager ship. Oh, do you have that? And it's yeah. it's a Voyager embroidered on the on the on the chest pocket, and it says Rick Berman is a personal friend of mine. <laughs> That's what he. And ours has the logo of Deep Space Nine with the same caption. The same <laughs> caption. There you go. There you go. I I didn't get one. What? I didn't, get, I didn't, get oh, I didn't even sorry. get buffalo wings, man. I didn't even get buffalo wings. <laughs> Heck, I didn't even meet you till season seven. I remember, I remember when I was working on the shows, I'd see Garrett across the way and I would look at him and wave and he just, and then just walk away. And I'm like, God, it really hurt my feelings. You know, like, I'm like, this guy, he's like my age. He seems like a nice, what? Yeah, you should have yeah. brought your parents. I, I did. I, I actually grabbed two people in the tour going by. I said, come here, come here. Just pretend, just say hi. Pretend, pretend you know me. Like I'm your son. And, and they walked up to him and, and he like threw a drink at their face and went inside. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, God, I just can't. But season seven, season seven, he actually walked into our stage and everything changed. But that's a story for another day. It is a story for another day. <laughs> okay. Uh, Armin, there's a question I have for you that I've never known and I've never asked you. 
how did you, and maybe it's a boring question, but I always wondered, and I know, you know, you come a lot from theater and you're a huge, very big, you teach Shakespeare and it's very important in your life. But where did you begin and what were your aspirations at when you, pers- when you decided to choose to become an actor and to pursue acting? I've never well, asked you that and I always wondered. Thank you for that. Uh, first of all, I never wanted to be in TV or film. I only wanted to be on stage. And uh, I knew early on that I was fairly good at Shakespeare. And Shakespeare was my way into the industry. Um, even before I graduated, just about a month or so before I graduated, I was given an incredible position uh, at the San Diego Globe Theater in, uh, in San Diego. And um, uh, it, it was a phenomenal opportunity. And I worked with some wonderful actors. And eventually they convinced me to go to New York where I worked with some more wonderful actors. Oh, wow. And I, I never want to do anything but theater. It, it was the only thing I really felt good at. Um, but, but unfortunately, or fortunately, certainly it's fortunately, but um, <laughs> well, one day while I was doing a play in New York, um, my agent got me an audition for a pilot and um, I auditioned in LA. And uh, two weeks later, uh, they asked me to fly to uh, Los Angeles to meet the producers and the network which I did, and they cast me. Um, and they threw a shitload of money at me to do <laughs> Money, I, I'd already done three or four Broadway shows. I'd never seen that much money. Um, wow. for, for, for a lot less work than I ever did on stage. And I said to my fiance, uh, that's how long ago it was. Wow. Um, I said, you know, maybe we should be bi-coastal. Maybe we should try. <laughs> So we came out to LA and, um, uh, and, and we never really moved back. But, but, but for the first year and a half, I actually spent more time doing regional theater than I did uh, living in LA. But, but eventually things got better as far as TV went. But I always felt like I was um, fooling people when I was on TV, that it really wasn't what I did well. What I really do well is, is perform on stage. Why Shakespeare? Um, I had an incredible teacher at UCLA. His name is Dr. David Rhodes. He, he fits into this uh, UCL, into this Star Trek scenario very nicely. Um, after I'd gone to New York, um, my teacher at UCLA, David Rhodes, who somehow, I don't know how he did it, was able to, to convince actors from England to come to UCLA to do scenes, work with some of the people on, on uh, Shakespeare and uh, to, to enrich Shakespeare for his students. He, he brought several young actors over uh, for many years. One of them was a young Patrick Stewart. And in one of these showcases at UCLA, uh, Bob Justman, who was, um, Roddenberry's uh, right-hand person, producer, happened to be in that classroom and saw Patrick Stewart doing a scene from Shakespeare, went back to the office when they were looking for a captain and said, I think I found the captain. And next to David, uh, David Rhodes, um, Patrick got discovered at UCLA. And in fact, after Patrick was hired, um, he he brought his family over from England. They didn't really have a place to live. Dr. Rhodes was uh, building a, a house in Brentwood. It was under construction, and Patrick and his family lived in the construction for the first couple months of, of TNG. Wow. That's a great story. <laughs> wow, I never heard that. I'm glad I asked that. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, they're all like just ripples in the pond. We're all just so connected. It's like Lorca on Discovery says, just fate, fate, destiny. You yeah. know, how much is that really intertwined? I don't know. That's a, that's a great story. I, I, as you get older, you meet people that you have brushed against, and all of a sudden, Renee and I, Renee and I did a play together long before Star Trek, and truly, all we did was brush against each other. During the course of the play, I, I had the first scene, he had the lead, 
I had the first scene. He wasn't in the first scene. And literally, when I finished the scene, I would walk down this staircase uh, to go back to my dressing room. And he would be walking up the staircase to make his first entrance. Mm. And that's as, that's as close as we really got during that play. And of course, now he's one of my closest friends. So. Fascinating. And, you know, Garrett and I brushing against each other for years. <laughs> on, on, oh my God, uh, man. Yeah, I, I barely even got some chicken wings out of it. Anyway. Speaking of UCLA, <clears throat> uh, which is my uh, alma mater, that's where I went to college. Uh, I don't know if you know this, Armin, but Robert Beltran, Chakotay from Voyager, is now teaching Shakespeare at UCLA. So, and I am teaching wow. Shakespeare at USC. Oh, so you went to uh, SC. Okay. We need a Shakespeare face-off. <laughs> USC versus UCLA. Uh, in fact, and I've worked with both of them. When, when, I, when I got the job at USC, I called Dr. Rhodes and said, is it okay if I teach Shakespeare at USC? Because <laughs> I'm a UCLA graduate. He said, by all means. But I didn't know that, uh, that Bob was doing that. But yes, we have to have a face-off. Yeah, oh, and for those people that awesome. don't know that, the rivalry is real. The USC-UCLA yes. rivalry is a yes. very, very big, you know. Garrett, you should make this happen, Garrett. Make this happen. A USC-UCLA Shakespearean face-off. I will, next time I see Robert, I, I'm going to talk to him. Because it's, uh, I'm into my second semester now, and uh, it's a learning curve. And I'd love to hear what his experience is. Oh, oh you're, this is your second semester of teaching total, right? You have, okay, yeah. You should definitely I've, I've taught for years. I've taught Shakespeare for years. Right, but, but at, but at USC, your yes. second semester, yeah. Um, yeah, you should definitely talk Dr. to him. I teach Dr. Seuss. You can. <laughs> <laughs> Although I think it'd be interesting to see you and Robert Beltran actually acting in a Shakespeare play, Shakespearean play together. That would be very I cool. would love it. I saw, I saw Robert in a play, I can't remember, but he was phenomenal. He was really yeah. good. But was this all, during the run of Voyager? Was this during the run of Voyager? Yeah, that was during the run of Voyager. Yeah, he did Hamlet, is, actually. The truth is, uh, almost all of us, most of us, are all theater actors. I think there's something to that, <laughs> why they hired us. Yeah. I think it's just because I was five feet tall and I was an adult, but that's beside the point. <laughs> I think there's a lot of truth to that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I liked up my resume. Well... Did some children's theater. He's good. <laughs> but you were good. And, and you did want to do more theater. I did. I did. I, I did not have the background in the teaching you did. You know, when you say what your foot in the door was, my foot in the door was that I was 18 and I looked 11. And I think I was a bit overconfident. And, and amazingly, amazingly, which is, which is why I feel that the writers were closer to the set than you felt, was, was how parallel... Nog's life was to mine. And, and not just in the story, but in, in, in the character development and how I felt he was a little bit more confident than maybe his capabilities were, but that confidence got him through the ups and downs of him going through uh, the journey of being in Starfleet and being an officer and an ensign and what have you. And it was the same thing I felt with me as an actor. I felt I was more confident in what I could achieve than I think what my talent level was when I first started. But my confidence got me through it um, to grow and become a better actor, if that makes sense. And, makes and, and, and both of us pursued lives that were very different from the norm of our species or our society. And it always fascinates me how Nog and my own life are so parallel. Um, it's, it's really incredible it, it, how that is. But, you know. Well, again, I, I think the writers got to know you, used what they saw of you on, in dailies and also on the set, and, and incorporated that into the character. And they yeah. wanted, they saw that Nog is a special character. They saw the potential there. They saw, they saw a way of, of, of making... Mind freeze. I concur with 
with Armin's assessment of Far Beyond the Stars uh, being his favorite episode to film, and and also his statement that it's that it is in his estimation the best Star Trek episode out there. And I I often tell people that um, the uh, some of Deep Space Nine ep- some of the Deep Space Nine episodes are by far the best Trek episodes of all Trek out there. Thank you. Thank you. The, oh my God. And Far Beyond the Stars definitely falls in that category. Write that um, down, Dick. Write that down. The episode of Deep Space Nine that moves me the most to tears would have to be um, The Visitor. Do you guys recall yes. that episode? Yeah, yeah, I was, I was in that episode, Garrett. Yeah. And well, here. again, I went to the restroom every time you came on screen. So I wouldn't. Well, then I don't know how you were able to watch that whole show then <laughs> and say the things but, you did. Yeah, so anyway, I just wanted to throw that in there. So what's your last question, Aaron, before we got to go? Before you oh. ask me, uh, uh, Garrett, many, many, many people would agree with you. I hear that over and over. The visitor is the one that they like the best. Oh, okay. And, and you know about that episode was Tony Todd, <clears throat> amazing man. He would talk to me asking me what Ciroc was like. What was Ciroc like? What is Jake like? He wanted so much to do such a great job at becoming Jake as an adult. And I'll never forget that. He asked me questions and we were talking about it. And, and uh, it was, I mean, the performances by him, Avery and Jake uh, are some of the best on our show. And I remember when I watched that episode, I was crying and I knew what was going to happen. I thought, I thought they just did a phenomenal job as well. And I think that was a good call. It's a yep. really, really good episode. I may be bullshitting you. I, I, I don't know where this is in the back of my head, but something in the back of my head says to me, and I could be totally wrong, that Tony Todd might have been the second or third choice for Cisco. Oh, wow. really? Huh. Wow. Well, maybe because he was in other, um, other shows of Star Trek, other, other played other well, characters. I know maybe the Star they Trek people are very good about giving people who were runners up uh, parts. Max mm. is a case in point. Uh, Andy Robinson was the other Odo. Um, oh, really? I didn't know that. Um, a number of people on your show, Garrett, uh, they both became series regulars, but but uh, as far as I know, uh, Bob Picardo was Neelix, and then he didn't want to play Neelix, and so they gave him the doctor. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, he, he auditioned for oh, Neelix. Since, John, uh, Ethan Phillips was the second uh, Neelix, and so they gave us the part. But but the, I, they were pretty good about if you came in close, which never happens on any other show. Right. You get really close, and then they never hire you. They never <laughs> want to see you again. Yeah. Uh, but but on Star Trek, they were very good about about saying to people, "You came close. Let's give you a consolation prize." Yeah. yeah you know, they had asked me. You know, in our first season, they said we got a new show coming. And we want to know if you're interested in playing Harry Kim. And I said, no, I'm very happy with Nog. It's a great character, and I just see a lot of potential. And they said, okay, okay, we'll give it, we'll give it to the other guy. But you know, that was so something. Ba- <laughs> Armin, back to what you said about Tony Todd. My goodness, that would have been quite amazing to see him in the role of Cisco. I would have, I would have really enjoyed to see that that portrayal of Cisco. Yeah, he would have done a great. You know, we, we never know what things would have been like if they'd gone a different way. What, it would, what would it have been like if, if uh, Andy was Odo and Renee was uh, Garrett? Or what, Max was Max Quark. was Quark and I was wrong. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, it's just another, you know, alternate universe. And, uh, uh, but it's sometimes it, it's, it's lovely to imagine that and, and wonder where that could have been. I um, often... Cisco was terrific. As, as Iris said to me many times, with all due respect to the other Star Trek shows, yeah. uh, Iris said many military people say that Cisco is exactly what command, their commanders were like. Mm. That, that, that is, that Avery's performance as, as, as a commander is exactly what their commanders were like in, in the military. And, wow. and respect the show because of his performance, because he gave them that. Um, so it, who knows? Maybe Tony Todd would have been different and it would have gone in a different direction. Right. right. I mean, who knows what would happen if Voyager got home in the third season? And, you know, it could have been a whole different and, show. And we know the story about your captain. 
We know that your, the original captain was not Kate. Mm -hmm. No, it was Jean-Vierre Bujold, and right. she quit. Couldn't she say quit on, yeah, she quit on the second day, right? So I, I was, I was one of two series regulars to actually work with her. So Robbie McNeil, Tom Paris, and myself were the only two regulars that actually worked with Miss uh, Jean-Vierre Bujold those first two days. So and let me get this straight. So, so she worked with you two, and then quit. <laughs> is that what you're saying you could draw what you'd like from that my friend oh i, I don't know i'm just asking because that's what you said i just she said you were the only two and then she said i can't do this i'm out of here that's pretty much it yes okay all right okay. i didn't you know when i worked on your show well i didn't work with you i worked with beltran so that's right yeah Aaron, do you have a final question for... i do have a final question armin so if if there's a better one you jump right in but was there Anything within our show after the seven years is done, all is said and done, that you all as the now we're, we're 25 years post, that you look back and go, God, I wish, I wish we told, I wish we did this. I wish we went with the Ferengi, with your character, with with or with anything within the show that you felt we told something more of or or that we didn't tell. No, I, I really think they investigated everything that they possibly could. I'm, I'm sure the writers could have thought of something if there was an eighth season. But um, no, I, I don't have any regrets about not doing something. I think they were enormously kind about letting me and, and you and everybody else um, uh, expand and expand and expand to our full potential. And... Uh, uh, no, I have no regrets. I, th I think they did a phenomenal job. And I was only, I'm, I'm still in, in awe that uh, I got the opportunity to do it. And, and, and when I die, my gravestone is not going to say Armin Shimmerman. It's going to say Quark. And, <laughs> as long as I'm right next to you with Nog and Max on the other side, that would be perfect. <laughs> I'm going to make a little room for a kitty there, Aaron. But uh, <laughs> Okay, Kitty can be on the other side. Yeah, of course. Absolutely. Um, we do need our uh, movie. I don't, I don't think that uh, there's anything that I would have wanted to do that I didn't do. They gave me every possible hue in the rainbow to play. And, wow. and it was quite, quite gracious. Con especially, go back to the beginning of our conversation, knowing how atrocious I think the whole journey started. When I think of that Ferengi on TNG and where Quark went and where Nog went and Ron and all the others, um, uh, I'm, I, no, I have no regrets and, and nor can I think of anything that would have been different. I 100% agree. I 100% mean, I, I agree. I think we have such a, a beautiful show. Now on Garrett's show, I do have something I would <laughs> I, I will say this, guys. I will say this. They give TNG four feature films. There should be at least one Deep Space Nine movie and one Voyager movie. The last two TNG films, Insurrection and Nemesis, were garbage. And those two should have been uh, definitely reserved for our two shows. So that would have been. You, and you know why. Should I tell everybody? I'm sure you guys know why. I, I don't know. You could tell me. Go ahead. I could tell you. So it's. Uh, listening to a Ferengi, it's about economics. Mm. The TNG uh, movies uh, got more expensive as the actors asked for more money and, and the scripts asked for more money. It just became more expensive. But for all the TNG movies, none of them made more than they cost. Mm. They, they, they came out about even with uh, income and, and uh, outgo. It was the perception of Paramount that none of the shows that followed TNG were as popular as TNG. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the idea of making a movie that, wasn't, that couldn't possibly exceed the revenue of TNG um, and would probably, in their opinion, make less, uh, there was no point in making those movies. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's how I always felt too. I, I'll say this much. No. Our final episode was a two-parter, okay? And look who came to save you. 
<laughs> yes, exactly. The final episode was called Endgame. It's a two-parter. And all the fans say the same thing. The first hour was lovely. The second hour tied everything up too quickly. So I actually, t- I went up to the writer's office. I said, guys, why don't you do this? Why don't you show the first hour on TV and then say, to be continued at a theater near you. And that's the gimmick, the hook. You've got to see the final episode. So that's why I thought it would be a definite moneymaker. Well, but, but the only know. problem with that is then you're only, you're only attracting the people that watch the show. And I think in a movie, you need to attract more than just the people that watch the show. I think exactly. you've exactly. got to bring in, you know, people that will, like, oh, let's go watch a new Star Trek movie but they don't need to watch the TV show to go see it. And, and you know, I, I, I think, um, and I, I think that's one of the successes of Discovery right now is that I think you can jump into Discovery and not feel like that you didn't watch years and years of Star Trek to enjoy it and become a part of it. Um, and, and it. and it stands on its own within the world of Star Trek. And I think that's exactly what they needed to do to grow Star Trek and keep it moving forward, in my personal opinion. Gotcha. Uh, Star Trek, I, I think, is best suited to the TV medium because when you make a film, it has to be self contained. It, right. In the beginning, the middle, and the end, there can't be anything that follows that film really. Uh, it has to be contained in those two hours. Um, whereas TV, you can, you, can, you can open up an avenue. You can shoot it for 43 minutes and then you can extend it the next episode, the next couple of episodes, the rest of the season. Um, and, and so because Star Trek is, is our modern mythology and, and following that myth, it's better if it's a long form than a short form. It's better if it's a long form. Well said. All right. Aaron, are you good? No, I got oh. one more. What's okay, but I know we're on time, right? Red Dick, are we how much over? Five minutes yeah, we're, over? We're over. We're over. Go, quick. Yeah, but okay, okay. Someone asked me this, and I never thought of this. They say Star Wars is through the eyes of C-3PO, right? And R2-D2. Someone thought that DS9 was through the eyes of Quark. That's right. Did you ever think about I, that? I did, and, and Ira reaffirmed that to me. Really? I, yes. I, it's the reason why I have the last line in the, in the show. Wow. And I said, everybody's got this arc. Everybody's gone off to do other things. And he said to me, and he's right, Quark is the station. You are the station. Hmm. And we see the show through the eyes of the station. Um, and it's why, as I said, they gave me the last line. And, uh, um, and he's right. Uh, uh, I embody that whole community. Wow. Awesome. I'm glad I asked that. I didn't know. That's, oh, that's great. That's great. That's really cool. That's, that's awesome. a good, end. that's a good, uh, that's a good ending right for us right here. Yeah. So, thanks, guys. Thank you very much. Yeah. Lovely. Uh, thanks for sharing your, your, uh, your ideas and, and uh, stories that I had not heard before. So. And thank you for all of your insight. Thank you so much. And on behalf of uh, both Aaron and ED, our producer, we are so happy that you came on tonight to be our special guest. And honored, honored, Armin. We're Thank very you. honored, and we love you. And uh, Thank you. we love you too. Yes, and uh, tell, again, please tell Kitty we say hello and that we love her, and uh, just have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Talk to you both soon. Thanks, Armin. Right. Bye bye. Bye bye.